right? You guys are all smart, and you all are responsible for the words that you use. Okay, the words that come out of your mouth, you are responsible for them. You are responsible for how they impact and how they affect other people. And you can't just get up and just say what you want to say because you believe that you are right. Okay, because everybody believes that their religion is right. But it doesn't give you the right to offend other people because you believe you are right. Okay? Yeah. So Prophet Muhammad called humanity to the religion of Al-Islam. And that even included Muslims, right? Yeah. How do you call a Muslim to Islam if he's already Muslim or she's already Muslim? How do you call a Muslim to Islam? Stand up. How do you call a Muslim? Yes, stand up. No, not, not you. You're sweet, you're beautiful, but not you. <laughs> yes, you, stand up. The reason why I'm asking you guys to stand up is because I want you to get over your fear of standing in front of people and talking. Because if you are going to be a da'i, a da'i is someone who does da'wah, then you have to be comfortable standing up in front of people and talking about your religion. You can't be afraid to do that, right? Prophet Muhammad, I can't hear you. I just want to put all of your energy in a bottle and take it with me. <laughs> all right. So he stood on a mountain. Do anyone know what mountain it was? Which mountain? Which mountain? Safa and Marwa. No, not Safa and Marwa. All right. Safa. He stood on the mountain of Safa and he yelled out, Oh, tribe of such and such, yeah, Beni Fulan, yeah, Beni Fulan. And all of the tribes came and he stood on the mountain in front of all of these people. Was he afraid? No. Was he scared? No. Absolutely not. So that is why I make you guys stand up. And he said to them that if I told you that an army was on the other side of this mountain waiting to attack you, would you believe me? And they all said, yes, of course we would believe you. He said, well, then believe that I am a messenger from God preaching to you to worship one God. Right. And he stood in front of so many people. So we can't be afraid to stand up and talk about what we believe. So that's why I'm making you stand up. Stand up. OK. So what was my question? How do you call a Muslim to Islam? Because we said humanity, and humanity includes Muslims. So how do you give a Muslim da'wah if he's already Muslim? Like, can you call him, uh, you make the adhan so, the the so they can come to the Masjid and pray? You make the adhan so they can come to the Masjid and pray. That's a good perspective. Not where I was going with this, but actually it's good. How do you call a Muslim to Islam if they're already Muslim? Stand up. How? Uh, help them practice the religion. Help them practice their religion better. Absolutely. Help them practice their religion better. OK, so da'wah was not just to people who were not Muslim, but also to Muslims. Didn't Prophet Muhammad? <laughs> didn't he do halakas in the masjid? Didn't he give khutbahs on the minbar? Yes. So that was a form of da'wah that he was giving to Muslims. And he gave da'wah to people who were not Muslim. Okay? So how do you give da'wah to someone who is not a Muslim? How do you give da'wah to someone who is not a Muslim? Stand up. Yes. Yes. How do you talk to someone who is not a Muslim about Islam? Give them information about Islam. Give them information about Islam. Okay? That's one way. Yes, stand. Leading them to Islam? Leading them to Islam, how? Because I know where you're going, I just want to pull it out of you. How? Um, by teaching them the Quran. By teaching them the Quran, okay. Good, yes. Stand. By giving them good advice. You guys are going around in a circle. You're missing something. Huh? Yes, you. By manners, 
By manners? OK, great. You're giving me the, the how. I don't want the how yet. I don't, want that, I don't want that how yet. The first thing, when we're talking about people who are not Muslim, the first thing that we need to understand is, what do they believe in? What do they believe in? People have different beliefs. And so before you can begin to talk to someone about Islam who is not a Muslim, the first thing you want to know is, what do you believe in? Right? It's to ask them, what do you believe in? All right, because when you give people an opportunity to explain to you what they believe in, then what you've done is you've validated them. You made them feel that although you don't agree with their beliefs, that their beliefs are valid to them. You always want to validate people. You don't always want to make people say, hey, what do you know about Islam? Don't you know that Islam is the truth? And the person might say, well, my religion is the truth. The first thing you have to do is validate people and make them feel that it's OK, that that is your belief. And you are entitled to your belief. The only thing I want to do is introduce you to something new. Hey, check this out. That is what you're doing. You're not coming to them saying, oh, what you believe, everything that you believe is wrong. Right? That's not how you give da'wah. You don't tell people that the way that they were raised, all of the things that they have been taught to believe in their lives is all wrong. Is anyone going to listen to you when you do that? No. no. No one even wants to hear about it. So the first thing you do is do what? First thing you do is what? Yes. No. What's the first thing that you do when you're talking to someone who is not Muslim? You ask them about their religion. You ask them about their religion. Hey, what do you believe in? And they may say, I don't believe in God, OK? If they say, I don't believe in God, then obviously your approach to them is going to be different than someone who says, I do believe in God, right? If someone says, I believe in God, but I don't have a religion, I just believe in God, your task is a lot easier than dealing with someone who says, I don't believe in God, and I don't believe in religions altogether, which means that people are different. So based upon people's differences will determine how you approach them about Islam. But the first thing you do if they tell you that their religion is Christianity, for example, they believe that Jesus died for their sins and that therefore Jesus is the son of God and they have to go through Jesus to get to God. So now you are aware, you understand what their plight is, you understand what their beliefs are, right? When Prophet Muhammad He sent one of his companions, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, to Yemen. And at the time, anybody here from Yemen? Al Yaman. Ahlu Yemen. Ahlu wa sahlan. Marahaban. MashaAllah. Tayyip. He sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen. And Yemen during that time was not Muslim, it was not a Muslim land. It was a land that was occupied by predominantly Christians, Christians and Jews. Right? There were no Muslims there. So the Prophet, when he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, he said, He said that you are going to a people from, we having a malfunction over here. You are going to a people. <laughs> It's a shaitan. You are going to a people who are. <laughs> I'm almost afraid to say it again. <laughs> he said, you are going to a people from the people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Who are the people of the book? They are used in the Quran. That term is used in the Quran in many places. What does it mean, people of the book? Stand up. What's your name? Shahir. Shahir? Yeah. MashaAllah. You know what Shahir means? It means famous. <laughs> Everybody knows you. You're Shahir. Famous. famous. What does, what does Ahlul Kitab mean? People of the book. What does that mean? That's a term that's used in the Quran in many places. What does that mean? You don't know? OK, good try. Yes. 
No, stand up. The people of the book means the prophets? Mm, no. Yes, in the back. Stand up. Yes, tall. Basketball player. Stand up. Christians and Jews. So he said, you are going to go to a people from the people of the book, meaning Yemen was a place that was populated by Jews and Christians, not Muslims. He said, and why did he tell him you are going to a people from the people of the book? Why did he tell him that? Yes. Why do you think he told Moab that? Mm, no. Why did he tell him that? Yes. In the back. No, no, no. But I'm asking the questions right now. Sit. You can ask me after, after we're done. Yes. Why did he tell him that you are going to a people who are Jews and Christians? Why didn't he just say, go give dawah? So, so um, my eyes know what, um, what people need to be going to. So Moad would know who he's talking to. That is my point. So he gave him some information ahead of time so that he would know who, he, who he's talking to. All right? Because people who are not Muslim, they have a variety of faiths, and they are different. And in every individual, you have to talk to them differently. So you can't say, one size fits all. I'm going to talk to everybody that is not Muslim about Islam the same way. You have to approach everyone differently based upon the beliefs that they have. OK? So when we talk about who are we calling to Islam, we're calling Muslims to Islam, as well as people who are not Muslim. Because da'wah is for humanity. Da'wah is for humanity. OK? So now that brings me, so we cover the what, the who, the where, and now let's cover the why. Why are we giving da'wah? Why are we calling people to Islam? Why? Why? Why is it important to tell people about Islam? Why is this so important? Yes, right here with the glasses. Stand up. Why is it important to tell people about Islam? Say it again. Uh, because if you don't tell people about Islam, there won't be any Muslims anymore. Mm, no. Good try, though. Why? Why do we tell people? Why is it so important for us as Muslims to tell people who are not Muslim about Islam? Why? Yes. Yes. Stand up. So Allah can be happy? Mm, no. Nope. Why is it important for us? Yes, you. Stand up. So we can establish the work of Allah. Do you hear that? MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. What's your name, young man? Huh? Noweed. Noweed? Noweed. Noweed. Okay, so that we can establish the work of Allah. Okay, that's one. Very good. There's another answer that I'm looking for. Why is it important to call people to Islam? Why is that important? Why? Purple jacket. Stand up. I can't hear you. So they? So there can be more Muslim or so that they can be Muslim? So they can be Muslim. So people can experience, so people can experience the faith of Islam. So people can experience the faith of Islam. Allah revealed in the Quran a verse. He said, Kitabun, a book that we reveal to you. That you can take people out of darkness into light. By the permission of their Lord, okay? So the goal, the overall goal of talking to people about Islam is to bring them out of the darkness of disobedience to Allah, out of darkness of disbelief in Allah, 
out of the darkness of misconceptions that they have about God into the light of Islam. The word Islam, right? They say that the word of Islam, it means peace. That's not what Islam means. Islam is the masdar. It is the noun that comes from the verb aslama yuslimu islaman. Aslam means to submit to something. All right? And although we translate Islam as peace, that's not what it means. Islam means submission. Who are we submitting to? To Allah. And once you submit to Allah, then you have peace. Then you have peace. But you don't get peace simply because you take your shahada and you become Muslim. That is false. Because there are many Muslims who do not have peace. Right? There are many Muslims who do not have peace. Right? Don't you know that there are Muslims who commit suicide? Who want to kill themselves? Who have tried to kill themselves? There are Muslims who, you know, use drugs and alcohol. There are Muslims who, do not, who are not at peace because they have not submitted themselves to God. So the peace only comes when you do the submission. Okay, so Islam is a religion of submission, not a religion of peace. So once you submit to God, and what does it mean to submit to God, to Allah? What does it mean to submit? What does that mean? What does that mean to submit? I want someone who didn't raise their hand yet. Someone who did not raise their hand to participate. Some of you older girls and boys. What does it mean to submit? Yes. Stand up. Yes. What does it mean to submit? Don't try to be correct. Just say it in your own words. What does it mean to submit? Huh? That you do what for something? You go to something? Hmm. Just think, for example, if, if, if me and somebody else was wrestling, right, and he had me down on the ground, and I say, okay, okay, I submit, I submit, I give up, right? Think about that. So what does it mean to submit? What does that mean? Yes, in the back. To give up. To give up. Okay, so when we say relig- Islam is a religion of submission, what are you giving up? When you become Muslim, what are you giving up? Because we need to be clear about that. What are you giving up? Yes. Yeah. What are you giving up? Some things that you love in your life? Mm, No. When you say you submit, you got your hand up or you stretching? Uh, Say it again. Elaborate. What do you mean? Okay, so it's basically a sacrifice. You're giving up certain things to get other things. This is what a sacrifice is. So when you submit, you're sacrificing. You're giving up things that you like for things that you like even more, right? What are you giving up? For example, when you fast, what are you giving up? Say it. Food Food and water and drink, snacks candy, sugar, all of the things that you love, you're giving up, right? You're giving up something you love for someone that you love even more. Who is? Allah. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what is called sacrifice. And you guys will learn this throughout your lives, in your friendships, in your marriages, with your children. You will learn the concept of sacrifice. Giving up something that you love for someone or something that you love even more. There's a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبٍ لِلَّهِ And those who believe they love Allah even more. They love Allah more. More than your desires, more than your food, more than your sleep. When you get up in the morning for Fajr, what are you sacrificing? Your sleep for what? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to pray, to prostrate, to put your head on the ground. 
You're giving up something that you love for someone that you love even more, right? Who can give me another example of sacrifice that you do in Islam? Yes. What are you sacrificing? No, give me an example of something that you give up for something that you love even more. Something that you sacrifice. Yes. Stand up. Yep. Not eating any food. And you're giving up food for? For Allah. Okay. Give me another example. Yes. Stand up. Yes. Sacrifice. What are you sacrificing? Okay, for what? For, Allah. for obedience to Allah. So you're sacrificing being disobedient. For example, when your mom or your dad tells you to take out the garbage, clean the dishes, clean your room, and you don't really want to do it, but you do it anyway, you sacrifice something that you love, which is your free time to play on your tablet, to pay on your iPhone, to pay on your iPad. I, 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 I. You see where, you see where that's going? Right? It's all about me. Right? You're sacrificing something that you want to do for someone that you love even more. Who is? Allah. No. In this case, it's who? Your mother and your father. Right? Your parents. Right? Isn't your parents more important than your free time? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. D didn't your mother carry you for nine months in her stomach? Yeah. Do you know how hard it is for a woman to walk around with seven pounds, eight pounds? Some of you might have even been 10 pounds with your big heads, <laughs> right? Do you know how hard it is for a woman to carry seven pounds in her stomach like this, walking around all day long? Her back hurts. Sometimes she can't sleep because she don't know which way to lay because she's trying to protect you. She can't lay on her stomach. She can't lay on her back. She can't lay on her side. Sometimes she has to just sit up. Sometimes she has to drive to the store and she's driving like this because her stomach is so big it pushes up against the steering wheel. She did all of this for you, right? And then you come out and your mom asks you to clean your room and suck your teeth. I don't feel like doing it, right? After all of that that your mother did for you, right? You do for that. Huh? You, you like doing bad things uh, after all she did for you. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Are you a good kid to your mom? You are obedient? Okay. All right, so we covered the who, what, where, and why of da'wah. All right, so do you guys have any questions for me? So you had your hands up in the back. Yes, how can I help you? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Absolutely. Although during that time, those names, those names, there was no Afghanistan during that time, right? Yeah, and India. 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 Okay. Mashallah. Your social studies must be your favorite subject. <laughs> or you have very intelligent parents. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, they did. So now I want to ask you, how was the Muslims able to convert all of these people to Islam? Was it because they went with their swords out and they said, either you're going to accept Islam or we're going to kill you? Is that the way they turn? Is that the way that they call people to Islam? How did they do it? How did places like Yemen, a whole country that was Jews and Christians now is a whole Muslim country. 
How did a place like India, which now separated into Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and all of the other stands, right? <laughs> how did the Muslims, how were they able to convert all of these people to Islam? The areas of Damascus and Syria and Iran and Iraq and how did all of those people become Muslim? How? How did that happen? Someone who didn't raise their hand. Yes, right there in the back. Stand up, please. How did all of these people convert to Islam? How did that happen? They had patience and took their time. Okay, but how did the Muslims do it? How were they able to get these people to believe in Islam? How? And we live here in America, and the Muslims have been here in America dating back to the, I mean, practicing outwardly, openly Muslims. I think the earliest masjid that I can think of that I was informed of in this particular area, in the tri-state area, New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia, is in Philadelphia, 1913, the earliest mosque I can think of. But yet and still, we haven't been able to convert a lot of people to Islam during that time. What did they do differently than what we're doing different or than what we're doing today? Yes. How were they able to get all of those people to convert to Islam? Yes. By giving them dawah. By giving them dawah. Okay. What else? Did they offer them candy? What did they give them? <laughs> Stand up. How did they get them to accept Islam? Huh? They taught them the way of the Prophet. How? How did Mu'ad call the people of Yemen? Yemen. How did they call the people of Yemen to Islam? How did they get all those people to become Muslim? What did they do with the, with the Quran? How did they use the words of Allah? Provide proof? Okay, that's one way. How else? Yes. Yes, stand up. <laughs> By what? <laughs> By telling them kindly. Okay, you're teetering. Yes. Stand up, I can't hear you. <laughs> By? <laughs> By explaining the words of Allah. One of the most effective ways of giving da'wah is through your character how you behave, how you act. People watch you. They look at everything that you do. You guys are going to go off to college, some of you. <laughs> some of you are going to go off to college. And in college, you are going to be met with a classroom that is going to be multicultural, meaning multi. There are going to be people that have different cultures, different races, different religions, different beliefs. And that is going to become the time where you now have to use your character to call people to Islam. Because people are going to watch everything that you do. And you can either be the quiet person who sits in the corner and doesn't get involved, or you can be a socialite. Meaning you can intermingle with people and share your beliefs and share your character with people. And someone is going to say to you, hey, you're a Muslim, right? And you're going to say, yeah, of course, the coolest religion in the world. Absolutely. Right? Because being Muslim is cool. Make no mistake about that. I didn't know what cool was until I became Muslim. Make no mistake about that. And then they're going to say, well, what do you believe in? Like, I see you wearing your hijab, or I see you with your beard, and I see you with, you know, you pray all the time, and I like that. I want to be a part of that. And that was because of your character. People are not paying attention too much to what comes out of your mouth. People are paying attention to how you act. Because sometimes people act in contradiction to what comes out of their mouth. They say, I'm Muslim, but then they have bad behavior, they're rude, they're disrespectful, right? And if you say you're Muslim, but then you disrespect people, is anyone going to listen to what you have to say? No. Absolutely not. That means that what's coming out of your mouth means absolutely nothing, right? So it is your character and how you conduct yourself that will attract people. I'll give you an example, and I'm going to end with this. One of the companions, his name was Salman al farisi I turned it off and it's still. 
One of the companions, his name was Salman al Farisi, right? Salman al Farisi, he was a Persian. He was not an Arab, he was a Persian, right? Who came from a more Catholic Christian background, right? Well, there was no Christians back then, they were Catholics, all right? Okay, because the area of Persia, which is now known as Iran, that area was controlled by Catholics. The Roman Catholic Church, they owned that particular land, right? And Salman and Fadisi, he ran away from home and he heard that Prophet Muhammad was in Medina and he wanted to go find out if he was really the prophet. So when he got to Medina, right, his father used to be a preacher, so he knew about religion. So when Salman and Fadisi got to Medina, he knew that from the qualities of prophets is that they don't eat from sadaqah. When people give a prophet sadaqah, prophets do not eat from sadaqah. They give sadaqah away to other people, all right? So Salman said, I want to try and see if he's going to eat from the sadaqah. So he picked up some dates and he walked over to the prophet and said, here are some dates. I'm giving it to you, sadaqah. What is he doing? What is he doing? He's giving sadaqah. To the prophet for what? What does he want to see? He wants to see if he will um, eat the sadaqah. He want to see if he's going to eat the sadaqah. What would have happened if the prophet would have ate the sadaqah? What would have happened? What would Salman think? He wasn't really the prophet, right? Because he knew that prophets don't eat sadaqah. They don't eat from food that is given away as sadaqah, right? So he said, here, Muhammad, here's a bucket of dates. I'm giving it to you, sadaqah. The Prophet ﷺ, he never touched it. He called his companions and told them, kulu, you guys eat it. So Salman said, hadhi wahida. He said, that's one sign, one sign. So he's watching him. So then he knew that prophets, they eat from a gift, a hadiyah. If someone gives the prophet a gift, he will eat from it, okay? So he took a bucket of dates and he gave it to the prophet and said, hadihi hadiyah. He said, this is a gift for you. And the prophet ate from it. So what, what did he notice? What did he notice? Yeah. They don't eat from sadaqah, but they do eat from gifts. So when he ate from the gifts, Salman said, Hadihi thaniya. That's number two. Watching everything that he does. And then Salman, he knew that the final prophet would have the seal of prophethood in between his shoulder blades. So while the prophet was sitting down, Salman kept inching over, trying to see if the seal of prophethood was in between his shoulder blades. So when the prophet noticed that Salman was looking at him, what did he do? He lifted his shirt down like this so that Salman could see it. And then he put his shirt back on. And Salman said, Hadith, Hadith. He said, that's number three. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And he took shahada. But did, he, did the prophet say anything to him about Islam? No, he did not. How did the prophet call him to Islam? How did the prophet call him to Islam? How? How did he call him to Islam? How did the prophet call him to Islam? In the back, red hoodie. Red Nike hoodie. By his character. He never said a word to said man about Islam. He never said a word. But he used his character, and Salman was watching him. So what I'm telling you is that when you come in contact with people that are not Muslim, they're going to watch everything that you do to see if what you say is consistent with what you do. And if they notice any contradiction, they're going to use you as an excuse not to become Muslim. They're going to say, see, that's why I don't want to become Muslim, right? You see? So don't ever be someone's excuse not to become a Muslim or not to be interested in Islam because of your character, okay? You guys have been great.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise you all and make you all du'at callers to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your characters as well as with your kalam as well as with your speech. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You got to do better than that. I'm getting ready to leave. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.